We're talking today about the whole problem of free will. You know, uh, do we have free will? And uh, if so, why do we have free will? And we're talking about it in connection with the general subject that we've been discussing for several months now of uh, why are we alive? What is the meaning of life? Why are you here? Why do we even exist? And we've discussed for many uh, weeks now the documentary evidence that substantiates our respect for the historicity of uh, that man uh, known as Jesus of Nazareth. And if you want to examine that kind of presentation, please do send for some of the cassettes of the previous broadcasts, because we have now reached the point in our discussion where we're beginning to talk about the explanation of the origin of our own lives and of the world that is given in this old book that many of us, of course, for years have regarded as just a religious myth, that is the Bible. But Actually, it's a very sensible down-to-earth book and is not only the basis of all the works of people like Shakespeare and our poets, but is probably more respected by the scholars of every generation than any other book. So it is important to look at it. And it's that book that we're discussing in the light of our own present experience of life so that we're not only uh, urging each other to believe blindly some kind of myth, but we're examining this intellectually to see does the explanation of the origin of life and the reason for life and the purpose for our existence, does that, as presented in this book, make sense in the light of our own present experience? And that can at least give us some idea of uh, whether this is likely to be true, and above all, it may help you yourself to work out a philosophy of life that makes some sense to you. So that's what we're doing. And we've got to the point in this explanation that was given to this man Moses uh, thousands of years ago by the supreme being of the universe. We've got to the point where you remember the creator of the universe uh, decided to make us uh, so that we would actually have a love relationship with him. That's why he made us. He made us because he wanted us to be his friends. And that, we said, was reasonable to believe in the light of the fact that the most uh, valuable thing in your life is probably friendship, isn't it? I mean, the most, uh, the deepest thing that you have is probably your relationship with your wife or a friend or with your mum or your dad or with your son or your daughter. Those are the things that really matter. That's the highest point of uh, existence here on Earth, a human love relationship. So it is perfectly reasonable to believe that what the Creator explained through his son Jesus and through this servant of his, Moses, in the early years, that uh, that is true, that he made us so that we could have a real friendship with him and a real love relationship with him that would go on throughout uh, years and centuries in the future, in fact, through timelessness, as we were used by him to develop the rest of his universe. And then we said, do you remember, that because of that, the creator of the world made us in his image. That is, gave us the capacities that he has, gave us spirit capacity, uh, intellectual capacity, emotional capacity, volitional capacity, and physical capacity. And then, you remember, we said that he did not, however, make us unavoidably good. He did not make us so that we couldn't do anything else but love him. Because if he had made us that way, we would have been a bunch of robots or performing dogs. In other words, uh, love is only possible if you have free will. Uh, you're only able to love if you're free not to love. And so we have reached the point in this discussion where you remember we looked back to the way the creator of the world presented this to mankind in his childhood. Uh, in, if you ever have a look at the Bible and glance at Genesis chapter 2 and uh, verse uh, 16, you'll see these words, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden. Well, that's pretty... A clear declaration of free will. You may freely eat of every tree of the garden. You, you may do it. Uh, you may if you want. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. And obviously he was giving a clear direction. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
uh, because if you do, you'll die. Now, you only give a command to a person who is free not to obey that command. Uh, if he's not free uh, to obey that, uh, to disobey that command, then you don't bother commanding him. Now, that makes sense. So, uh, built into that verse is a clear declaration that the maker of the universe said to us, now, I've given you capacities that I have, but uh, if you want to be like me inside, if you want to become the kind of person that I am and uh, be at home with me uh, through timeless eternity, then you've got to choose that for yourself. You've got to choose it. Uh, I'm not going to make you like myself. Otherwise, I just have a bunch of performing dogs. I am going to give you the capacities that I have, and then you must decide for yourself whether you're going to receive my kind of characteristics and attributes that I have, whether you're going to be like me inside and therefore find it bearable and indeed enjoyable to be with me. Now, that was the way the creator of the universe made us at the beginning. That's the origin of free will, you know. If you say to yourself, oh, why have we free will? Will you free will because it makes it possible for you to be like the creator of the universe and to be a fit and worthy friend for him. That's why you have free will. That's why you're free to turn the car to the right or turn it to the left, stamp on the brake or stamp on the accelerator at this moment. You're free to lift your phone and phone some friend. You're free to do what you want within the limitations that you've begun to impose on yourself, of course. But the creator of the universe said, I've given you certain abilities that you will not lose. And that's true. You know, it doesn't matter what you've been like in your life. You still have a mind. You still have emotions. You still have a will. You still have a body. You still have a spirit. It doesn't matter what you've done. You've still done those things. You've still got those things. But uh, those are the indestructible characteristics uh, or capacities that God has. We're all in that way like him. That's why we're able to talk to each other. It's interesting, isn't it? That's the why it's possible for the discussion that we're having uh, together today to make sense. Because actually, we're all the same. I mean, you have the same things in your life as I have. You have the same capacities as I have. Because we're all made in the image of the being that created us. And so we can speak to each other in the same terms. We understand each other. But he said... If you want to become like me inside and be actually somebody who will enjoy my company and whom I will enjoy, you must choose to receive that for yourself. And he presented that as a tree of life uh, that we were to eat uh, as opposed to a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that was the choice that we had. So uh, that was the way the Creator made us. He made us like himself up to a point but like himself also in that he gave us free will. And then he gave us the choice of using that free will either to become like him or not to become like him. And the way we would become like him, of course, he presented as this tree of life or this tree of knowledge of good and evil. What is the tree of life? Well, it's really pretty close to the experience that you have with uh, a husband and a wife. Uh, they marry... Uh, they aren't very like each other, but meet them five years later and you'd think they were brother and sister. Meet them ten years later and you'd think they were identical twins, almost. Because the truth is, you become more like each other the more you live with each other. You just do. It's ra rather embarrassing. It's rather embarrassing the way a son imitates his father. It's embarrassing to the father. It's embarrassing at times to husband and wife when they see how the same inflections of voice are beginning to be experienced and expressed by both of them. It's uh, embarrassing to see how uh, alike they are when they smile. Because when you walk with a person for a long time, or you live with them for a long time, you just become like them. That's part of what the tree of life is. The Creator's plan was that we would live close to him, much as you remember it said in those early chapters, Adam wa uh, God walked with Adam in the garden in the cool of the day. It was through friendship and company that the Creator planned that we would become like him. To some extent, that's part of the explanation of the tree of life. Now, what else does the tree of life mean? Well, let's talk a little more tomorrow, and it might help you to understand the way you're living your life a bit more clearly.